So our first article will be presented by Vanita Swaminathan from the University of Pittsburgh. And Vanita is part of a team of researchers that sought to understand how companies can improve the effectiveness of their influencer marketer activities. We know that about 75% of marketers today use influencers to spread word of mouth about their products and brands on social media. But despite this explosion, it's interesting that the effectiveness still remains pretty low. So thank you for joining us to discuss this important topic, Benita. Thank you, Chris, and thanks to everyone for joining me today um, to share some of our insights uh, from this research. And um, we're going to be talking a little bit about how online social influencers can help uh, drive engagement with your product and brand. Um, so what is influencer marketing? So the topic, as uh, Chris mentioned, is uh, pretty interesting, and uh, influencer marketing can be thought of as this new kid on the block when it comes to social media marketing. And what it is is, is the use of opinion leaders to disseminate information about particular products or brands. Um, what's unique about influencer marketing is that it represents a mix of what we call paid media and earned media. So on the one hand, um, companies are typically seeding information about products and brands through these opinion leaders and influencers by paying them uh, to share that information. However, um, the influencers themselves have the discretion to share uh, whatever content they feel is appropriate. And so it represents this interesting blend of being a paid medium on the one hand, but is also earned medium in that it, it resembles organic word of mouth to the extent that the influencers have some discretion as to what they want to say about your product or brand. So given this, this combination, uh, we feel that influencer marketing allows companies to speak to consumers um, with, uh, with authenticity and credibility. And that's particularly important today where a large proportion of uh, consumers, especially younger audiences, are increasingly skeptical of traditional advertising. Um, the availability of ad blockers has made it hard for companies to use more traditional forms of advertising with uh, certain segments of the audience. So within influencer marketing, our research focuses on sponsored blogging, in which influencers are bloggers uh, and they write blog posts. Um, and in return for writing about certain products or brands, they may receive compensation um, for, from the companies. And wh uh, what I'd like to note is in the research that we conducted, all of the sponsored blog posts contained a sponsorship disclosure. So it is required by law that the bloggers actually state that they were paid for uh, that particular post and that it is indeed a sponsored post. And so I just wanted to clarify that everything that we uh, examined in our research had this, this declaration at the top or uh, somewhere in the blog post. So here's an example campaign. Uh, Choice Hotels uh, chose mommy blogger Chelsea Foy to participate in a sponsored blogging campaign. And so you see on the left of the screen uh, something about the blogger. Um, hey, lovely, welcome to your online BFF. And on the right, you see something about her uh, post about this particular uh, service provider, Choice Hotels, a weekend trip and a $500 hotel giveaway. So this is typically the type of campaign that we examined in our research. Not surprisingly, given its, its value, influencer marketing spends are projected to increase at a rapid rate. And by 2020, it's expected about $10 billion of marketing budgets uh, will be dedicated to this particular uh, type of uh, communication. Uh, and as Chris mentioned, a large number of com companies are increasingly turning to influencers to increase awareness, engagement, and revenue. But uh, what we're finding uh, is a marketing problem is despite these increasing expenditures, the overall effectiveness of social media influencers is really low. Um, for an average influencer on Facebook, the, what we call engagement rate per post is 0.37%. On Twitter, it's even lower at 0.05%. Uh, so let me just clarify what we mean by engagement rate per post. Um, as you probably know, it, it's really the percentage of people who choose to interact with your content. And those interactions are typically measured in terms of things like Facebook likes, um, the number of comments that your blog post generates, and so on. And so one can calculate the engagement rate per post, and uh, it typically is, is um, very low, indicating that um, more uh, 
information or insights are needed uh, to understand how to drive engagement. Um, when we talk to a lot of uh, companies in the industry, the traditional influence marketing strategy, and I recognize this is a very, very new phenomenon, uh, but even so, um, in, in the earlier days, uh, a few years ago, um, the approach was one size fits all, where audience size, so you try to pick bloggers or influencers based on how large the audience is that they commanded. Now, uh, when we think about influencers, on the one hand, we have these macro influencers, these influencers, you know, you think about large celebrities, um, Kim Kardashians of the world who have millions of followers. What we're talking about is, is this um, avenue of micro-influencers who don't necessarily have millions of followers, but let's say they have tens of thousands of followers. And so in our research, our focus is on these micro-influencers, but even their um, audience size seems to be a key driver of compensation and choice of influencer. However, our research suggests that there's a number of factors other than this, and we'll get to it in just a minute, uh, that may drive engagement. We examined um, influencer marketing on two platforms. We studied sponsored blogging, and so naturally the blog environment uh, is the key platform that we zeroed in on for this research. But bloggers also posted, uh, cross-posted their um, information on Facebook, and so we examined that. And a key distinction between blog and Facebook environments worth noting. Uh, so we did some additional surveys to, to understand what, what were some of the key fundamental differences, and we argue that blogs are much more involving. Um, the audiences that interact with content in a blog environment tend to have less distraction, um, whereas in Facebook, um, there is a lot going on. So it's a very high distraction environment. On a per post basis, the involvement tends to be quite low. So the marketing problem is, while we have a lot of expenditure on influencer marketing, the, the effectiveness seems to be pretty low. So how do you solve that? So the research question is, can we be more strategic when we are planning and implementing an influencer marketing campaign to maximize engagement? And consistent with the practice and industry, we define brand engagement on a per post level in terms of the number of Facebook likes that it generates, uh, or in the blog environment, the number of comments that a blog post generates. Our data comes from a leading agency uh, for sponsored blogging campaigns that focuses primarily on mommy bloggers. The data set spanned a time frame from 2012 to 2016. We analyzed 1,830 blog posts derived from 595 bloggers and 57 campaigns. And so the agency um, interacts with a variety of leading providers of products and brands. Some of them are listed on this slide. And we measured the engagement per post for each of these um, campaigns and for each of the bloggers that were um, sponsored to write on behalf of these products and brands. We measured the Facebook likes and comments per blog post. So what, how do you design an, a, a, a really good influencer marketing campaign? Here are some factors that we think are pretty important. The type of social media platform, the size of the audience, the intent of the campaign, the expertise associated with the blogger, which we call source expertise, the characteristics of content, and the incentives that, that surround the campaign. I'll talk about each of these in turn. So when we think about social media platform, as I mentioned previously, our focus was on two, the blog platform, which we identified as a low distraction environment, and the Facebook platform, which we describe as a high distraction environment. So we examined these two types of platforms. We also categorized bloggers based on the size of the audiences that they commanded at the time of the campaign. And to do that, we accessed the number of followers that they had on Facebook and Twitter combined. We argue that these are the major social media platforms. Uh, we, um, for example, a blogger Sunshine and Sippy Cups, as shown on this slide, could have 19,389 followers at the time at, at which this campaign was run and on Facebook, and then they might have 31,000 followers on Twitter. And we, we um, looked at both of those numbers uh, to, to uh, compute the audience size for each of the bloggers. We um, also looked at campaign intent. When companies approach these uh, influencer marketing agencies, they typically have identified specific goals. It's either that they want to build brand awareness or they want to induce trial. 
And these are the two key variables that uh, we studied in this research. Uh, here are some examples. AT&T Mobile Safety is an example where the primary goal is to just generate awareness. Um, and the Listerine 21 Day Challenge is an example where the goal is really to generate trial. The fourth variable that we looked at are, is blogger expertise. And so we studied the profiles of the bloggers and how they self-described themselves. Um, so on, on this particular slide, you see Renee Ross. She talks about herself as a Nielsen Power Mom, uh, Polar Ambassador, Spelman College grad. So educational and professional qualifications of the blogger defined whether a blogger was seen as a high expertise or a low expertise blogger. Uh, in the low expertise case, you look at this uh, example on the right, she talks about family, travel, quirky, sparkly, and so on. And so this is an example of low expertise um, blogger. We also defined the content. Now we took each blog post and did a deep dive on the content itself to identify the hedonic value of the post, which means does it generate a lot of enjoyment and excitement and enthusiasm when, when a, a typical audience member reads it? And so we coded it using judges uh, in terms of whether it's high hedonic in value or low hedonic in value. We also looked at campaign incentives. And so in this case, um, Hotel Transylvania has an, an unlimited price pack that they're promising as a giveaway. And we determined that this was another important factor driving engagement. So what are our key takeaways? So as we uh, noted, audience size continues to be an important factor driving engagement. And there's no disputing the fact that it is uh, continuing to be an important factor. However, we feel that there's these other factors of the six that we talked about can be pretty important as well. And those uh, vary in importance based on the type of campaign as well as the social media platform. What's another interesting finding was that on Facebook, when you do a weekend post, it typically drives engagement. But uh, among the factors that we identified, we found campaign incentive to be effective, particularly in the blog environment. We found that it didn't work as well in driving Facebook engagement, primarily because um, incentives tend to direct traffic from Facebook to the blog post itself where the audience engages. And so uh, one of the takeaways at a more broad level is that you have to sort of imagine that these social media platforms might be cannibalizing from each other. And so when you're doing a multi-platform campaign, you've got to factor in the potential for cross-platform cannibalization. We noted the importance of hedonic content, whether the content itself generates a lot of enjoyment and uh, excitement among your audience. And that, that seems to be a very important driver particularly in blog campaigns, regardless of whether it's a trial or awareness campaign. In Facebook, hedonic content is important, but it, it seems to be more important when combined with a trial um, campaign type. And I'll explain that in just a minute. Blogger expertise, interestingly, uh, whether the blogger is self-described as having professional and educational qualifications drives engagement, but in different ways based on the campaign goal. Earlier on in the consumer decision journey, a high expert blogger, one that has a lot of professional qualifications and educational qualifications, seems to be driving engagement much more so, whereas the closer a consumer gets to trial, the actual purchase, they're much more receptive to messaging received from low expert bloggers who may be seen more as peers. And so uh, we argue that based on where you are in the consumer decision journey, the audience can be receptive to information from high and low expertise bloggers. We also argued that these platform specific findings um, are worth uh, noting. So high expertise bloggers work well in the blog environment when paired with awareness campaigns. Low expertise bloggers work well when paired with trial campaigns to induce greater engagement. Hedonic value of a post is critical. Uh, and in Facebook in particular, it works well when you're combining it with a trial campaign. And we argue that's because on Facebook, the typically commercial um, messaging is done through Facebook advertising. Uh, the rest of the content tends to be more about um, non-commercial uh, messaging. And so when you do have a trial campaign which has this commercial intent, you want to be able to generate attract, uh, attract audiences in different ways. And so hedonic content seems to be uh, able to develop that um, increased engagement on Facebook, especially when you have a trial-based campaign. So in action, what does that mean? So you think about generating engagement for an awareness campaign in a blog platform. 
you want to choose a high expertise blogger. You want to make sure that you provide a campaign incentive. Um, and um, both of those things, uh, along with good hedonic content, seems to be successful in driving uh, campaign uh, engagement. In a Facebook environment, um, we find that having less expert bloggers using hedonic content and encouraging your influencers to post on weekends is a key driver of success. Overall, I want to argue that influencer marketing is a way for marketers to speak to their audiences using this authentic voice. And because it uh, has components of organic word of mouth, the information provided by these bloggers, especially in the blog environment, tends to stick around for a long time. And so um, while advertising on social media can come and go, uh, some of the posts made by influencer marketing, particularly if they're perceived as genuine and enjoyable by your audience, can have important long-term effects. And that concludes my presentation. I just want to say thank you once again. I also have a number of follow-up studies on online brand engagement. I'd welcome an opportunity to talk about those if any of you is interested. Uh, but at this point, I want to uh, throw the floor open for questions. Thank you, Vanita. Um, so right now we have time for questions. That was very interesting. And um, there's a lot of different facets that we know are important in managing influencer marketing and bringing those all together into one study and sorting them out. It's very, very useful. So I'm sure there are questions. So um, if you'd like to ask a question, you can type your question into the Q&A tab, um, not the studio chat tab, on the left side of your screen. So we'll wait a few seconds here. So actually, here's a question. Um, so do you think you focused on Facebook quite a bit in, your, uh, in the study that you did, um, but what is your sense of how well your findings might generalize to other types of platforms? That's a good question. I think uh, at the time of this research, uh, the social media platform environment is evolving very fast. And so um, it's very difficult to uh, state how the, the platforms are going to evolve going forward. However, we tried to categorize platforms based on the amount of distraction present on the platform, as well as how involving the um, the um, platform itself is. And so to the extent that you can categorize platforms based on those uh, underlying factors, which have always been important in marketing. So we think about you know, what's the amount of noise when you read a you know, print ad versus, let's say, um, uh, let's say on, in a television ad, where is the distractingness greater? Um, so similarly in a social media platform environment, I think to the extent that we can categorize this very fast evolving space based on core marketing factors such as you know, the extent of uh, um, distraction and so on, one can generalize some of the findings from our research to other contexts as well. Interesting. So Erica has a question regarding what's the biggest benefit of having bloggers post on the weekends? You mentioned that finding. So what's yeah. the biggest benefit? Um, I think it, it, again, tends to uh, vary a little bit across platform. On Facebook, we're finding this weekend effect is stronger. Uh, we believe that, again, uh, it's, it's the mindset of the audience at the time in which they're engaging with the content. Um, uh, it could be, you know, this is this is Facebook, and so um, for some of the products that we were looking at, and remember the, this was a study that focused primarily on mommy bloggers, we felt that, um, you know, posting on weekends in Facebook would generate the best benefit. Um, again, you know, we sort of have to match the campaign intent, the type of product with the platform characteristics in order to uh, ensure that the weekend effect is something that we would uh, continue to see. In fact, that, that's con that co your, your response is consistent with a follow-up from Erica, which she asks, were the demographics of the blogger matched with the demographic of the target Facebook audience? Absolutely. I think what, what happens uh, when uh, – so I just wanted to briefly touch upon how these campaigns work. When a company approaches one of these agencies, um, there's many of them that, that help you identify the appropriate bloggers. 
uh, they come in with a campaign intent, but they also come in with a description of the profile of the audience. And so bloggers have different demographic characteristics. So you could have bloggers, let's say, categorized based on the age of the children uh, that they have or um, the kinds of activities or leisure activities or interests that they are uh, focused on. And their audience, the blogger's audience, mimics the blogger's characteristics. And so when you're choosing a blogger, you're also saying something about the type of audience you want to appeal to. And therefore, to answer Erica's question, which is a very good question, uh, it's one of the things that goes into the design of an influencer marketing campaign. And we have some uh, things in the paper that, that allow us to capture that uh, at, the, at the selection phase where we uh, model how these bloggers are selected. Um, before we get into the engagement piece. Wonderful. So here's a question from John. Uh, your paper shows, basically, your research shows that, that you have this increase in engagement, which you, you, which you discussed. But do you think that, do you expect to see an impact on purchase behavior or, you know, firm sales or things like that? Right. So those downstream metrics are not immediately available or were not immediately available to us at the time of this, this uh, research. However, we did do uh, some work where we looked at this metric called return on engagement. Uh, what that is is really a way of quantifying the value of a Facebook like. Um, there's different metrics uh, clearly or different ways you can go about doing that. However, um, we did not have data that was specific to an industry. So the value of a Facebook like or a value of a blog comment could vary depending on the type of product category you're in your, or your industry. But using an industry norm of $1 per Facebook like, which is a general norm, um, it's not super nuanced to the category, we were able to calculate the appropriate, uh, approximate return on engagement by um, uh, imputing a cost for for uh, imputing a revenue for each of the Facebook likes and blog comments based on these um, general assumptions and also looking at the cost of those campaigns. So that's one way you can start to look at whether or not there's a good return on your uh, influencer marketing efforts. Uh, whether or not to answer your second question, which is does that lead to other metrics such as purchase behavior, as we build out um, and become more sophisticated in tracking uh, social media, the social media metrics, um, and, and um, looking at how to link them up with, with sales, we might have better answers. But at the time of the study, we did not have that particular piece of information, although we'd, we'd have loved to have looked at something like that. Um, well, maybe that's also something that one of, the, one of our listeners would be happy to engage with you on in a future research project. It sounds like <laughs> super interesting, super important too. I um, would love that. Love <laughs> here's that. a question from Joe. He's he's getting at more kind of uh, the front end of the process. He says, "What are do you have any? Do you think that the, the sort of prior engagement levels of of potential customers, you know, that that affects these campaigns too? So the sort of engagement level that they bring to uh, the influencer." Um, kind of exposure event, um, and what if, if that prior engagement level is important, what are some of the drivers that, that you, you think might be out there as it, that might influence that? Yeah, that's a very nice point, and I, you know, I'm glad that, that you asked that question. One of the things, metrics that bloggers themselves are tracked on is how much engagement that they generate. And when I said that you know, the medium is, is very effective, that's one of the things I was thinking about, uh, I, was, I was trying to highlight. Um, so when you're asking a blogger to post on your behalf, let's say you're, you being the company, the blogger is making this trade-off, right? So they are actually uh, have to ensure that, they're, um, you know, they, they, that they post information that, um, that has a high degree of veracity so that their audience sticks around. And so they want to make sure that they please their audiences and give them accurate information uh, to, in, to ensure that they stay engaged. But at the same time, they want to make sure that their purposes for the campaign are fulfilled. And so it is this fine balance, or that's where you're uh, engendering trust. And so to the extent that, um, to the extent that we have that uh, information for prior blogging behavior, whether or not their audiences are being engaged, it impacts their remuneration as well going forward. 
um, I know that's a bit of a more nuanced answer, but you know, so I, I'm just trying to say that yeah, we do. The bloggers are tracked on how well they can appeal to their audiences and their prior engagement mm -hmm. levels form an input to how they get reimbursed in the future. So the bloggers have to be very careful as well to make sure that the information that they provide to their audiences takes into account the audience's best interests. That's that, that's super helpful. So the so Joe and Eric, I have a quick follow up that kind of both um, asking about some additional details. So is there a difference between products and services in your findings? You talked about hotels and things like that, but ver versus products. And then also AM, PM, late evening show kind of effects. Do you see timing effects, sort of day of time effects, or product right. and service differences? Um, I, I would argue, I think that's a, those are nice points as well. We did look at product versus service differences, and I don't believe we found anything significant there. Um, I do believe we had a good mix of both types, um, but I don't think we found significant differences. Um, we did also look at um, the timing question is an interesting one. We believe that the blogging environment is much more uh, of uh, you know this longer term kind of information sharing where the particular timing is not as critical. But given that it's a very high high involvement medium, um, it doesn't matter as much in the blogging platform. On the Facebook platform, uh, timing is probably important, although we did not look at that in this particular research, but it's a very interesting question to hmm. look at going forward. And we had a study that, a paper that we published uh, that's up in our Scholarly Insights series that looks at how time of day affects social media. Mm -hmm. So if, um, Erica, if that's something you want to look for, you can look in the Scholarly Insights section. If you can't find it, you can email me or someone at the AMA, and we can help you find it. But it definitely shows that there are, <clears throat> excuse me, very important time of day effects in terms of the way that the effectiveness of social media. Um, so th there may be something lurking in here as well. Um, yeah. So um, just one one final question. Jose had a bit of a quip. Uh, to respond, he said, "Why do you say that people uh, involve so involve easily with social media?" That must have been a comment that you made um, a few minutes ago. Do you have a response to that? Um, why do people involve? Are they, why are they easily engaged with social media? Yeah. In, well, I, I, again, again, I think there's platform differences there too, right? And we mm -hmm. find, as I mentioned, Facebook. You know, people are overall engaged with Facebook, right, as a medium. But on a per post level, simply because there's so much noise, um, you probably don't see that. And so this is this is the big challenge of social media, right? Is it really an advertising platform, or is it something mm -hmm. that people go to to talk to friends and affiliate with others, build connections, and so on? Um, so the challenge for marketers is really to take this overall engagement with social media and convert it to something, or or maybe not convert it to something which is of commercial um, nature, right? Mm -hmm. So that goes back to this point about influencers, right? Influencers are already engaging their audiences with content and information. So leveraging that um, to in an organic or semi-organic way through influencer marketing seems to be a, a better way to go than trying to flood social media with ads many mm -hmm. of which are working at cross purposes as to why the audiences are there in the first place, right? They're, they're not necessarily always there to look at commercial advertising messages, hence the popularity of ad blocking and, and some of these other uh, services. Um, so yeah, yeah, so I think that's kind of, again, um, answering this at two levels, right? Overall, they're, they are engaged in social media, but for purposes that may not be relevant to commercial right. purposes or intent. Well, what about, just to, to, as we've got about one minute left, do you, what about, there may be marketers listening who have very limited budgets. Um, right. I wondered about, I don't know how expensive this is. You might have some insights. What, what, do you have any recommendations for marketers with limited budgets in terms of using these influencer marketing campaigns? Yes, and so I, I, that's a very nice question as well, simply because it, it's on everybody's mind these days. Like, how do you, you know, get the best bang for your limited marketing uh, buck? And so, um, influencer marketing can be very expensive, especially if you're chasing the macro influencers. It's not easy to get 
um, a Kim Kardashian or a Car Cameron Dallas, who's another popular Instagram influencer, um, to tweet about your product or make a, a or say something on Instagram. It's expensive, and a lot of companies uh, are going in that direction, thinking that's the only way to use influencers is to go after these big celebrities. However, we argue that the micro influencers, the ones with very focused audiences who have very specific interests and a, a very loyal following and a highly engaged audience can probably allow you to save some of that limited bar marketing budget because they, they tend to be a little cheaper um, than the, the macro influencers, but they're also very effective because of the loyalty that they command and the very focused nature of their audiences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. Well, that's um, that's very helpful. So, well, thank you very much, Benita, for taking the time to to be part of this webinar, um, and wish you the best of luck with this research. Thank you again. Anytime. Thanks, Chris.